Hi, we're here with Stuart Spence today. Um, how's it going? Uh, I'm good. How about you? I'm good. Um, so um, you mentioned uh, you mentioned in your talk that you're a, um, a teacher. What do you teach exactly? Yeah, that's right. Well, I'm a, I'm an instructor, so I'm not actually certified to teach, <laughs> even though I'm still teaching. And it's because they need technology teachers so badly that they made an exception. Uh, and I'm teaching, yeah, so technology. And it's uh, almost any technology topic I want because uh, no school administrator really knows how to tell me what to teach. Because um, they don't know, like, they're just like, oh, programming, computers, I don't know. Like, so I can really, I have a lot of freedom. And I've chosen to teach uh, a lot of 3D games programming. Uh, we also do uh, stuff about privacy and encryption and a lot of programming and computer science. Uh, but mostly it's 3D games. And that's a high school level, and my group is uh, grade 9, 10, 11 this year. Yeah. Awesome. So um, how do you think the education system you have in Quebec compares to what we have here in the U.S.? Yeah, um, it's kind of hard to say because it's, you know, Canada and the U.S. are so big. Um, but I do follow a fair bit of news, and, and I would say uh, Canada and the U.S., the standards for teachers is, is not very good. They don't get enough support, and they don't get enough training. So that's, uh, we have that in common for sure. And so when you're talking about 3D, teaching 3D games programming, something I'm trying to do is make it as simple as possible so that teachers who have never programmed before can still do this. Because that's really the big barrier we're talking about in either country, is you can't just make up a law one day and say, oh yeah, like, or the school boards just decide we're going to teach coding because they don't have the, the teachers with the skills to do that. And I see in the, the United States a lot of really cool programs, though, so they have, uh, just because, you know, ten to eight times bigger or whatever uh, than Canada, they have a, a lot of funding to create large initiatives that look really great. But, you know, you're not going to see a widespread adoption all over the country with these things. So I'm seeing a lot of really awesome programs in the States, stuff coming out of uh, San Francisco, of course, <laughs> naturally. Um, that looks very promising and like alternative models of, of education. But when we're talking about like widespread adoption, I think it's things are quite a bit of a mess right now. Um, in, in either country, uh, if you're a science teacher and you want to teach about uh, acids and bases, um, what is the funniest video about acids and bases right now, a modern video? I don't know. Science teachers don't know, and this is a problem we all have. You know, they should be able to just be like, oh, here's like a 10 minute funny video that came out two weeks ago, and, you know, the teacher wouldn't even know what celebrities they're talking about in the video, but it would just, there's no system in place kind of unifying it, and we definitely both, both countries have this problem. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so you incorporate um, 3D games a lot. Um, how do you think uh, 3D games can help uh, inspire students for things like exploring Mars? Yeah, that's, uh, that's the question. Um, so the thing about exploring Mars is, you know, you can't just, you know, we're not the magic school bus with Miss Frizzle. You can't just take a class and just, oh, yeah, we're going to go off and, Go to Mars today. Um, you need to do some kind of simulation, some kind of pretend or a game or imagine we're there. Or what do you think it would be like if we were there? It's really inevitable. So if you want to inspire kids to be interested in Mars, which, by the way, is really important because at the Mars Society, when we're talking about all of these amazing plans, well, who's going to do it in 20 years, 10 years? It's going to be the kids in high school right now and we have to inspire them somehow and playful learning is a great way to do that that's a uh, sort of a new uh, idea in education where you can play games and learn a lot from it and so 
I've, I'm already doing that with 3D games, and it is so easy to just slip in a little bit of Mars, you know? If, if uh, you know, it's as simple as, as making a, a game where you press play, and you can just walk around, and the floor is red, and you just say it's Mars. And, and that's all it takes to then, you know, you start asking, like, well, when I jump, is this, is this right? Um, where's my oxygen? Do I need oxygen? Um, you know, you start asking all these questions just from a very, like, very, very, very simple game. And it doesn't have to look like, like a nice, polished game that you would buy. It can look really bad. And, and actually, you know, if my game doesn't look great, but in high school, kids are just so happy to just do anything with 3D games. Even if it's their game that looks kind of like garbage and everything's cubes and, and just the art is terrible, they're so happy to do it. And, you know, you just can put in any theme you want. It could be, I mean, it could be Mars, it could be Earth, it could be um, anything you really, really want to do. And it doesn't take much to just, because a game in the end, it does require imagination. You know, you're not being shown exactly, perfectly the world you're simulating. There comes a point where, you know, the, the person who's playing it has to imagine it. And if you ch tell them they're imagining Mars, they start asking all these questions about it and how to do that better. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so uh, at the Mars Society Convention, um, you showed an open source game that you um, created for your classes. Um, and yeah. 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 I understand you were um, gonna show off a little bit about that today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I'm gonna fire that up, and we'll see if we can screen share uh, on this feed. We'll have a look at that, just so people people know what we're talking about. Um, are you seeing my screen? I think I so. I see it. Okay. I'm gonna fire it up. Awesome. So Unity is a 3D game making tool, and it's free. Um, so that's good. Uh, so yeah, this was the game I showed. And as I said, yeah, the graphics aren't perfect. <laughs> but uh, you know, kind of looks like Mars. Uh, this terrain is, uh, actually, this terrain isn't real Mars terrain data, but my, my other levels are. This one's just kind of a test world. But uh, so one thing that's kind of neat is you can hop in a rover. And I don't know how good the stream is, like if you can see uh, how many frames you're getting. But so the wheels are bouncing up and down. And there's a, something in high school called Hooke's Law, which has to do with springs and compression. And so even though this code here, like when I, I made this game, you can't just tell a class to like, hey, like let's make this. Like it's way too advanced for them. But what you can do is you can give them this project, and you can tell them, you know, look for Hooke's law. Like show me Hooke's law in the code, and they can look through it and, and actually find that, which is pretty great. Um, another thing you can do here. Uh, this can tie into science class as well. There's, these are uh, flywheels, so it's like a heavy weight that's spinning to store energy. There's some solar panels, and you can build a bunch of stuff. And this is, again, you know, something I showed in, in the talk, but I just think it's great, is the um, atmospheric water generator. So we know that there's trace amounts of water in a lot of Martian soil. And... In this case, I'm going to build, I'm going to complete this, because the way this works is, well, I'll, I'll put, down, put down the dome here. So in my inventory, I've got like some plastic sheets right here. And if I go around and build this, and it's going to take a little moment, but the way this works is, is once this dome is built, it traps sunlight and it heats up a little bit and because of the low pressure it's enough to evaporate you know and get some humidity in there and then this is a condenser and it condenses and gets a little bit of water um, so you can bring this into a science class you can bring this into a programming class 
And there's a lot of difficult questions you've got to start asking yourself because you have all this information. Uh, here's the atmospheric water generator. It's now active. It's using my electricity and it's making water. Right now it looks like it's making about uh, like a kilogram every like eight seconds. And you know, you ask your class, does that seem right? You know? And it's really not. Like if we had this kind of production on Mars of water, that would be a dream. Uh, so you've got to go into the code and maybe adjust that. So there's all kinds of Mars science questions you can do with this. Um, and of course, the only reason you can do this is because I made this game and I'm just giving it away. Um, all, you can open up this game and make any change you want to it. You can copy it and look at how it was made. Now normally when you buy a game, like if you buy a, there's a lot of other examples of, of even Mars games, but they're not good for a classroom because you know, if, if you see something like this, well the water is being produced too quickly. If you buy a game, that's that's it. You can't change this. You know, you're stuck with this, and you're not al allowed to change it with your game. Uh, so if your science class doesn't like the science of your game, because you know a game is going to have uh, errors in science all the time, uh, but you you're just stuck. But when it's open source, you're allowed to to do any changes you actually want. Um, so that's. That's uh, one of the games I made. I've made quite a few others. I'm going to turn back my face, put my face back on. How do I turn this off? Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Okay. There you are. <laughs> so there's the game. That's, that's one of them. I, I, I have more. But uh, that's, that's uh, the Mars one, and I'm, I'm fond of that one. It's good. Yeah. Awesome. So um, that's some of the benefits of open source as opposed to closed source games. Right. Uh, yeah, I got into that a little bit, um, but that's that's really the trick. Well, first for the you know the the audience, people watching, the difference is that um, so normally when you make a computer program, there's a lot of text. It's like a document, so you're actually writing text, and it's instead of in English or French or whatever language. It's written in like a programming language, and it kind of looks a little more mathy and gibberishy. But so you have all this text, and programmers know how to read it and change it, and they can understand it. But normally, when you buy a program like Microsoft Office or World of Warcraft or a game, you don't get that text. So that's closed source. And the problem with this is that. A lot of schools use a lot of closed source software. So if you're learning in your in your class, oh yeah, we're gonna play uh, Minecraft, which you know there's a lot of educational value in Minecraft. But if a student asks, oh, that's really cool, how does Minecraft do that? The teacher has to actually answer like, sorry, you're not allowed to know the answer to that question. Um, it's locked down, and that's what closed source means. So a lot of what I'm trying to do is get schools to be more aware of this. It's not a question of, uh, of just never doing closed source in schools and always using open source everything. You can't be that extreme about it, but you do need to know the, the drawbacks. Um, and there's a lot of advantages to open source that are really not being used enough. And uh, if you want students to be interested in it, you know, like. Uh, I, I, I took a open source Minecraft clone. So someone remade a lot of Minecraft, but they made it open source. So it's not quite as good, but it's for a class. Like they're like, whoa, it's Minecraft, and they're happy to take anything. And we made our changes to it. And, you know, people could, we did all kinds of exercises with that. You know, someone changed the, uh, the inventory screen. So normally it has a little like Minecraft logo, and she changed it to like some like male model or something. I don't know what she was doing, but you don't have that kind of freedom with uh, closed source in a school. So you can give way more different, you know, interesting assignments with that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, 
Why do you think the software created by NASA and the CSA are closed source? Yeah, how about that? <laughs> um, that's a problem, and I, I spoke about that because it's kind of surprising. Uh, they're publicly funded, and they're released for education. You know, you, you look at the when you play these games. There's a uh, and and you know anyone can look them up. They're free to play. Uh, Canada Arm Two, the Canada Space Agency made that. There's mm -hmm. the Curiosity Rover game, and there's uh, Moonbase Alpha, which I'm pretty sure that's free. Pretty pretty sure. Yeah, must be. But uh, these are all you know to raise public awareness, get people engaged with NASA, and get interested in space exploration and Mars. But yeah, they're closed source, so. What's with that? Um, I would love to take those games, like the NASA game, and just open it up in my class, and we could just have all kinds of fun with it. There's all kinds of crazy stuff we could do with that, but we can't look at it in a classroom, and it's very weird. It's definitely a case where uh, the people who, who paid, you know, because this was contract work, a lot of the time it's not done internally in NASA, at least. When I contacted the Canada Space Agency, they outsourced the contract. Uh, so these people who pay for that contract with public funds, they simply don't know to ask for it. And at this case, at this point, it would just be as simple as like, oh yeah, by the way, guys, do we just have that project? And you just copy files and you just make them on available online. Um, that would be really great. You know, I'd have some students putting. Uh, Superman into the Canada arm simulator or whatever or they, they put all kinds of weird things that they make it their own and that's how they experience you know a game because uh, students now they're not really settling for just you know, like oh yeah like here's this tailored experience in a box and I'm just gonna do this they want to take it and they want to make it their own and they just demand to make their own changes to it and be creative and if they can't They'll get bored and they'll go to something else because there's a million things they can they can work on creatively, um, and that open source is great for that. But uh, if it's closed, oh, I got a cat. Actually, I think I need to <laughs> kitty kitty cat cat. That's the cat. <laughs> um, yes, so open source is great for that. Um, because you can make these changes. If it's closed source, the people who make the game have to predict in advance what changes people will want to make. And they have to, you know, put it in a box and be like, oh, we're pretty sure you're going to want to change the world in this way. But, you know, if it's open, you can really change it anyway. Any weird, even inappropriate way. Sometimes students want to do that too. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, I think in your talk, um, you mentioned some um, barriers for um, classroom integration. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Mama Yama. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, that was good. Um, yeah, so, so, and actually in the talk, I, I just gave that like 20 seconds because it was like, you know, the time was coming in on me. But uh, the Mama Yama thing was pretty hilarious. There's this, uh, this in Toronto I went uh, with a group I'm with called, called Kids Code Jeunesse, and they're trying to get coding into Canadian schools, which is great. It's what I'm all for. Uh, and there was some, like, uh, like, there's a picture of, like, this, you know, a, a, like an Elmo style, kind of like a, like a puppet. And it's just this weird looking mutated potato thing. Um, and and I had no idea what this was, but apparently it's like the Elmo of Canada. And when this person came in, it was the actual person who does the voice and everything. And they were like, "Ah, oh, it's Mama Yama!" And they all like they they loved it. Um, and you know, so Kids Code Jeunesse, you know, the reason I brought that up, that's what they do. They try to integrate this stuff in the classroom. I mentioned earlier uh, this this is a big issue because. Teachers may really want to do this, but they do not get enough support for code and for technology. And you know, slipping in Mars stuff, they don't get enough support for this at all. 
And that's one thing that this organization does. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to do that. And we're uh, volunteer training as well to teachers. Uh, so teachers who have no idea what they're doing with code, um, we will help them and come to their class and work them through it. And it's really just nowhere near as hard as you'd think it would be. Even 3D games, it's like, I I've taught 3D games to a grade seven group. Um, like this, the year isn't 1997, you know, like making a 3D game is not hard anymore. There's a lot of tools. Unity is just one of them. There's a open source game engine, Godot, Godot or Godot. There's Unreal, there's, there's Cry Engine. There's like all these tools. And it, especially in the case of Martian Agora, the My Mars game. Um, so I made that game. And then a teacher can just take it and just look at it. So you really don't need to know anything about coding to just copy a project, install Unity, open it up. Uh, so if you're talking about integration, that's really important. And this is what's great about open source. You only need one person, like one guy, maybe me, to make Martian Agora. And then all over, you know, a country, you could have teachers just copying it. And they don't have to be like expert game programmers to do it. They just take an existing project. And I've built a few of these that are designed for people to look at them and, and learn from them. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, how many students have you met who are actually interested in exploring Mars? So that's a, that's a funny question because like, I would say, at first, like none, <laughs> because that's that that's a, an issue that the three D game, the three D Mars game, can overcome. Is because you say Mars, and high school students they don't even really know what it is. They maybe know it's a planet, and they don't know maybe it's a gas giant. You know, they really don't know. They don't know that you can you know with a, a decent suit, you can stand on Mars and it's like fairly like reasonably Earth-like in a lot of in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of interesting aspects of Mars that are way beyond what they've been taught. So no, they're they're not interested at all in Mars. Uh, they don't know, you know, about just geology, chemistry, the physics of it. Why would it matter? If we found life on Mars, they'd be like, well, I can just go outside and find bacteria in the ground. Why do I care about Mars? Like, they don't understand the significance of many of the questions we're trying to answer. And so if you want to get students in on this, yeah, again, a great way is playful learning, where they just jump into a game and they start asking Mars questions. And you challenge them about their understanding on that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what's your favorite programming language? Right, yeah. Um, that's always a funny question. Uh, programming languages, you know, I, I know quite a few. I'm comfortable with quite a few. Um, it really depends on what you're doing. And Generally, the kind of projects I like to work on, it's great to use C Sharp or Python. Python's great for random fun stuff, uh, math challenges and algorithms, and I do artificial intelligence stuff and machine learning. That's another. I'm I'm a, in computer science right now in school, um, so Python's great for that for numerical data processing and. Uh, linguistic stuff, very fun. Uh, C-sharp is really the language for me because of Unity, because that's the compiled language it uses. Um, and it's very similar to Java, which I had started off uh, at, at McGill, the university I'm at. Uh, a lot of projects were Java, so it's, it's, it's so similar that I just quickly picked it up. Um, so those two are pretty good, uh, I would say. Yeah. Are you working on a any um, programming projects right now? Um, yeah, uh, naturally in school I'm doing that. But uh, the the sort of the things I'm working on now are 
because uh, I have a lot of videos. I have like 60 tutorial videos on Unity 3D for like high school level stuff. They're you know five minutes long. How to make a jetpack, you know, something like that. Um, but now I'm trying to kind of step up my quality, and I've made one that's uh, 3D games and trigonometry. So you make like an obstacle course with platforms that that move with like a sine wave and uh, I'm working on um, I'm working on another one that's coding playground that's like well it tries to put a lot of this together as well and I have I have a few playlists and one of them that I want to do which I totally can't do now because I'm busy with school but I'm finishing in December and I'm going to start doing this is uh, 3D games and Mars. So I'm going to go through Martian Agora and actually make these videos that piece by piece, you know, five minutes on that, and it will be like, oh, well, how did I do the, the gravity when you jump? You know, and you need to look up the actual value of gravity or, or whatever. Um, and the, the angle I'm going here is, is there's videos for students. But I actually want to make these videos for teachers, which it's just which is like my new thing, um, so that I want a teacher to be able to not really know anything about coding, basically, and they can just download my project, open it in Unity, watch my five-minute video, and they're ready to do like an hour of exercises with the the, the class. Um, I think that's because. People write like teachers write lesson plans, like these big documents. No one reads them. I no one reads them. No one wants to read a twenty-page document about how to teach a unit. I just I've met a lot of teachers. I feel like they skim them and they skip them and they just it's a strange thing they do. And I feel like a video is a much more accelerated, easier thing to digest a lesson. And so I'm gonna make some videos on how to do that with with Martian Agora, but I. I need to clean up the project too because I kind of it's I made it a you know a little while ago and I'm not fond of the code anymore so I'm gonna polish it up for that as well. And these are on YouTube and your website, right? Uh, that's right. I have a YouTube channel. Uh, if you search Stuart Spence, um, there's also Coding Playground is the website where you know I put all this together right now. Uh, it's codingplayground.ca. Um, my more professional portfolio is stuartspence.ca, um, where you see like you know really everything I've done. Um, but coding playground is I'm trying to 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 step that up and and turn this into something. Uh, I really feel like like I don't want to make a video that has been made a thousand times. Like here is what a decimal is, you know, and I'm on a a chalkboard, you know, like I'm not going to do that. I want to make a video that's never been made before. Like here's in trigonometry, the cosine wave. You know, this is making this platform move like this, and we're going to jump around on it and collect coins. I, I just know that hasn't been done at a high school level. So that's the kind of thing I'm putting together. Yeah. Awesome. That's all I've got. Anything you'd like to add? Um, uh, not not really. I mean, I'm I'm starting up a uh, probably starting up if I decide to do it. I guess in January of a master's in education technology. I'm really hoping to work together with uh, educators on some kind of projects. I'm looking for internships, hopefully paid or unpaid if they're awesome. Uh, I am looking for projects to work on with people. Um, it would help if I had a team. Uh, I'm not an artist, for one thing. Uh, I did all the art on Martian Agora myself, and it took a lot of work, and it's OK, I guess. But so, uh, so what I would mention is just I am looking for uh, teams of people who are interested in anything I just said and maybe want to work on projects with me, as long as they're open source and uh, and free generally, or some kind of model that's very flexible. So I don't want students to look at my website or look at videos and get an ad for World of Warcraft. 
if you're trying to learn, you, you should not be seeing an ad. Uh, it should be pretty much free. So if, you, if people are interested in that, they should contact me, and I'll, I'll get back to them about that. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and then thanks a lot for, for interviewing me. Uh, was checking out your channel. It's, it's really a bunch of neat interviews. It's good. So thanks. Thanks. All right.